Bourbon is just the vessel that brings us together. This is a hospitality business. Really what we're doing here is creating moments in people's lives where they celebrate something. It might be the end of the day, it might be the birth of their child. And the fact that somebody's gonna sit around with a couple of their friends and have a glass of bourbon and relax, you know, those moments are special. Hey, I'm Connor Gaughan, and this is Consensus in Conversation, a podcast where I talk with inspiring leaders aligning purpose and profit. Today, I'm talking with John Little, co-founder and whiskey maker at Smooth Ambler Spirits. When John Little started the craft distillery in 2009 in West Virginia, few would have bet that it would become what it is today, a highly respected bourbon distillery worth more than $30 million. Despite the fact that many high-priced bourbons are older than the company itself, John's commitment to the natural land, transparent labeling, and a great product have delivered stunning achievements. We're in the midst of a massive bourbon boom, and John is the perfect guest to talk about the future of bourbon, the strength of community, and how to disrupt a long-standing industry. So pour yourself a glass, sit back, and enjoy the conversation. How's it going, John? Thanks for doing this. Super excited to have you. Yeah, really glad to be here. Who doesn't love to talk about themselves? <laughs> Especially when it involves whiskey. He doesn't love whiskey and talking about yourself. That's right. So why don't we just start at the beginning? Give us a little bit about yourself. I grew up in a little small town in eastern North Carolina, a little town called Roanoke Rapids. Grew up in a real small family. My mom was a, a single parent who was a teacher, raising two kids. Didn't have much when I was growing up. We didn't worry about where our next meal was coming from, but we certainly weren't, we weren't living high on the hog either. My father passed away when I was really young, so I was raised by my mom and my grandmother and my sister and my aunt, pretty much all strong female figures in my life. Grew up hunting and fishing and being in the outdoors. Yeah, I had a great, had a great life growing up. I was probably not the best kid. Obviously, I moved out away when I was 18 years old. I went to college at UNC Charlotte, which they just call Charlotte now. I studied geography there, really land use planning and mapping. And uh, met my wife there when I was young, when I was 21 years old. And I uh, got married when I was pretty young, 24 years old. And um, moved from Charlotte to West Virginia in 2002. And I've been in West Virginia doing a couple different things really since, since 2002. 21 years now. And you call West Virginia home. It's an important part of your, your story now. How did that come to become such like an ingrained part of you? Uh, well, you know, people only move for two reasons, really, I think, love or money. And I move for love the next time I'm moving for money. <laughs> but but, uh, but uh, yeah, my, my wife is from West Virginia. Her family was living here. And we wanted to be, my daughter was about a year old when we decided to move to West Virginia. And it took some, it took some getting used to. We came out of Charlotte, right, a town that's continuing to explode so like well over a million people in the metro area now, and we live in a town of about 3,500 people. We live in a, an area called Lewisburg, West Virginia. It's a nice place to live. There are We live in a really unique area. It was named the coolest small town in America about six or seven years ago. There is now an amazing distillery called Smooth Ambler here. <laughs> and it, it feels like living a little bit like living in the 50s. Everybody knows everybody and everybody's waving to people on the street and your neighbors are on the front porch and they're looking out for your kids. And so we live in a pretty magical place and we're lucky to do that. It's hard not to fall in love with a place like that. Yeah. I was going to ask what the best part of living in West Virginia is, but I think you just told it to me. <laughs> so then how'd you get excited about whiskey? You know, I, I didn't necessarily get excited about whiskey. I got excited about we got excited about creating something. When I moved here, I was working in the restaurant business. I had kind of been in and out of that after college. And I moved here working in the restaurant business. A few years later, my father-in-law and I went into business. He, he's an architect and a dreamer of really big projects. And we were working on a project together, really where we we were procuring furniture and fixtures and appliances for 
hotels and high net worth individuals that he did architecture work for. Sure. And that business was great until the crash of 2008. And everybody yeah. pretty much stopped in, I guess that was September of 2008. Unfortunately, West Virginia gets a bad rap with lots of things. And there are not a lot yeah. of opportunities here, certainly not opportunities that people in, in larger areas, Charlotte, for instance, feel like are, are available lots of times. And so what we wanted to do was to create something here that showcased those things that we love here, that showcased West Virginia, that would create a world-class product here. And that, and that was really the principle of, and, and provide opportunities for people. And that was the principle that really drove our business. It wasn't whiskey specific. And then in March sure. of 2008, my father-in-law saw an article in Time magazine that talked about the growth of the micro distilling business. And he wrote a little smart ass comment in the upper right hand corner of that article and said, we can do this in your garage. 10 days later, there was a conference in Louisville called the ADI conference, uh, a conference that it was really created, an organization that was really created. It's called the American Distilling Institute that was really created to promote the growth of the business and to help people get started. We toured a couple of distilleries, Maker's Mark and Wild Turkey, and we went to Vendome. And Vendome is the manufacturer that makes all of the distillation equipment for all of the heritage distilleries. And when I went in there and I saw people making copper and stainless steel come together in an amazing way, I felt like I was in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. I knew I was going to be in the distilling business. And I'll never forget standing there, a guy with no experience, doesn't really know how stills work at all, other than what I'd read in the last 10 days. And I had decided that was going to be my future. It sounds absolutely ridiculous. And a little magical, too. <laughs> yeah, certainly. I look back on things throughout these periods, and we, we were fortunate, lucky, smart. I don't really know. A combination of all those things. Yeah, it all plays a role. So West Virginia, you're right, gets, doesn't get the credit it deserves. You don't, may not get the spotlight as much as the East Coast and West Coast cities, but you're doing stuff that's just as interesting, just as fun. And frankly, like you said, it's more meaningful to the community and and deserves a spotlight a lot more than it gets. So we're happy that we can have this conversation and give you guys a little bit of spotlight. Um, as we talk about you know the origin and, and getting that Time article with the little note in the corner from your father-in-law, sounds like how my father behaves too. It's like a, you know, cuts out things from the paper and puts it in the mail with an FYI, you know. It, it was clear then, and it seems like it's continued today, that we're, we've are we been amidst a whiskey and bourbon boom in America. I'm curious kind of for your take on the, the macro industry trends. Do you think that we are seeing, we have seen and continue to see a boom in spirits and in whiskey in particular? And if, you, if so, what do you think is behind that? Well, there's no doubt we're, We've seen a boom in the last 10 years. When we started yeah. in this business in 2010, there was nothing on the shelf. Whiskey was whiskey was really, um, at least the offerings on the shelf were so small compared to the offerings that are on the shelf now. Or the whiskey is as big as vodka on a, in a retail shelf now. And it didn't used to be that way, right? Yeah. We used to go into a store yeah. and, and, and if you had vodka and gin to sell, nobody wanted to talk to you. But if you had whiskey to sell, they, bar they were they barely even asked questions. They were like, yes, we'll take it. So some of it was the whiskey was really good. And some of it was the fact that the industry was really needed uh, bourbon on the shelf, bourbon and rye on the shelf. Yeah. And so absolutely, we've seen that. I think it really exploded from, say, 2011 to about 2016. I think it's calmed down just a little bit from 2000, maybe 17 to now. Of course, the last couple of years with the pandemic have been a roller coaster of changes and buying habits. Uh, yeah. But it, it really has it still continued to grow. I think there's some still more years of growth ahead of us. But uh, I think we are just now at the same level of consumption that we were at the peak of consumption. I think that was 1965 was the highest of whiskey consumption mm -hmm. in the U.S. And I think we've just reached that again. What's behind it? I think the cocktail world really drove that. And I think people are also tired of 
the same thing that they were getting in a market like vodka, where for the most part, everybody is making mostly the same thing. We made vodka. We thought it was different. I'm not sure there were material differences to satisfy the enthusiast world. And so sure. I think people are just tired of the same old thing. People were drinking what their mom or dad drank. They were drinking what they were marketed to or what their yeah. boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other was. And so I think people ready for a change and a bunch of folks, drinkers that were ready for change. I think the cocktail world and the food world was changing so much. And, you know, gosh, the people that are people that are drinking old fashions now, I'm not sure a lot of them knew what old fashions were 10 years ago. People's, their palates change. They, their expectations change. Their desires change. So two related questions. And one, what was it like? And do you remember that getting that first bottle made? And then second, similar question, how did you get that first bottle onto the shelf? Well, if you're talking about whiskey, we were a t- tiny distillery when we started. We built this business much different than you would build a business today in the space. We, we built our business with a $1.6 million investment. And it was going to be, in essence, a mom and pop distillery with a small steel. And we were going to be important in West Virginia and important in our region. And we were going to sell a lot of product out of the tasting room. In 2000, that was 2010 when we really opened our doors. In 2011, we realized we weren't big enough. We went to buy another still and somebody mentioned sourcing whiskey, brokering whiskey. We didn't even know what that meant at the time. We tasted a bunch of different products from at the time. It was very different. We tasted products from a lot of heritage distilleries and some, some folks who, who do contract distillation for other brands. And we tasted Mm -hmm. all those products. And when we tasted, I think it was the 11th one we tasted, we knew that was the product that we were going to sell. So for the last year or so, year and a half, all we had talked to about our consumers and our distributors was, this is grain to glass. We know the farmer. We mill it, mash it, distill it, or ferment it, distill it, put it in a bottle. We ship it to you. We do everything. And here we are coming up with a product that we didn't make. We didn't make it all. And Mm -hmm. so we called our distributors and said, hey, I know everything that we've done is about grain to glass, but we have this delicious whiskey. We didn't make it. We want to tell people the truth that we didn't make it. We're going to bottle it a high proof so that it stands up really well in cocktails and is good for the cocktail community. And we think we can price it pretty affordably. Can you sell it? He said, yeah. And so really at that moment, we decided that we were changing business practices kind of in a, in a couple of day period. And so we, we bought 40 barrels of whiskey, put it into a bottle and we started selling through those really, really soon. We created a label. We, we wanted to be open and honest and transparent about what we make. So we called it old scout. We were scouting for whiskey. We were looking for it and finding it and making it available to people. Try to tell a story of transparency and not only to tell people about the fact that we were sourcing this and do it with honesty and transparency, but to use that as a selling point. And that was the first product that we made, a five-year-old high rye bourbon from Indiana in the fall of 2011. And that's really what set us off. So it's crazy because we had done all this work to make whiskey and really in a pretty much a blink of an eye, as far as business goes, we had decided we, we had seen enough and we bought 3,800 barrels. So it was amazing from you know, having, a, having a bottle pretty quickly and having a new idea and our business plan kind of pivoted from what we were doing to the new sourced whiskey model. The good old P word, the pivot. Yeah. If you can't be flexible in your business plans and you don't see the trends and you don't make changes based on what you're seeing in the market and you're stuck in the old ways, you're in trouble. Yeah. That said, it's got to be an interesting novel challenge uh, to navigate a startup where products are oftentimes not sold the year they're made. <laughs> they're sold, you know, five, like you said, you had, yours is a five-year-old that you guys launched with, right? How did you think about that as a startup? Well, we didn't do a good enough job thinking about it, is what I tell you right out of the <laughs> gate. One of the sayings that I've used over the years is we think that some of the smartest people in the world are trying to figure out what's going to happen tomorrow or today at the stock market. And we're trying to figure out what people are going to do in 12 years from now or eight years from now. Yeah. And I think that's that's a very, very hard thing to do. When we started sourcing whiskey, the whiskey was five years old. We weren't smart enough to do 
barrel forecasting or barrel modeling. That's what we do now. So we take projections, uh, what we think the business is going to do. We, we buy, we were buying five year old whiskey. Now we'd buy some five year old and some four year old and some three year old down the line. And we weren't doing a good enough job of that early on. It really hurt our old scout brand as the brand was experiencing hockey stick growth. And the market in general was growing. There was not the availability of mature distillate. When you source whiskey, you can really buy it in two ways. You can buy it as a mature distillate, what we call spot purchase, or you can buy it as a new mate contract, whiskey coming right off the still. And sure. we kept thinking that the spot purchase market was going to be available, or we weren't aware enough that it wasn't going to be available, and we weren't buying new make and really at, a, at an inflection moment in the industry, we were really starting to lose our inventory. So it's something that we, that we're constantly evolving today. Now, as we're, as we're part of Perno, they really help us with both the barrel modeling and the projection. What's the business doing? What's the consumer doing? And being, trying to be aware of how that's going to affect our long range forecasting. It's a very, very complicated model for, yeah. for a small business like ours. It's, yeah. And, you know, the big question that anyone's trying to build something wants to know is, besides being an industry that was also experiencing great growth, is there anything that you can think back upon as a big contributor to finding the hockey stick in your growth? I do. I think there were a couple of things that, that were really responsible for that. One, we were the pioneers in being open and honest about sourcing whiskey. Yeah. I don't feel like we get enough credit for that. I've always said that. Nobody really wants to listen to me say it anymore. But we were the pioneers in telling people the truth. From day one, we told people that we didn't make it. That's why it was old, called Old Scout. Everything that's had the Old Scout name on the bottle is 100% sourced. And I think that's what helped us tremendously early on. Because there was a time in the business when people weren't being open and honest about it. It happens a lot yeah. now. A lot of people are doing that. And they're telling people, but at that time they weren't. And those people later on got in trouble. The second thing was, is that early on, a couple of customers of ours who became friends of ours said, you know, you should do some barrel selection, what we call custom picks. And we did one for a retailer in Kentucky, I think in 2012, late 2012. So you know, we have all this whiskey. A customer comes in, they taste through maybe six or eight samples of the whiskey. They pick the one that they like best, and then we bottle it with their name on it. And it was fairly priced. So the whiskey was delicious, high proof, priced well, and everything was unique. So every single barrel had something different about it. People think that's crazy, but there is. It's amazing how much variation sure. there is in barrels. And so... What happened was that was really driving excitement with early adopters in the bourbon business. And all of these super enthusiasts, we call them the bourbon nerds, and that's a badge of honor, not yeah. of any sort of cut. They were out seeking out all of these things. Oh, you, if you think barrel 1012 is good, you ought to taste 1323. It's at a different proof. And they bottle that uh, on a whatever, on a on a Friday morning, and the Friday morning barrels are always the best. <laughs> we actually sign every bottle. And one of the women who worked in the bottling room at the time, her name is Sarah. People were actually seeking out bottles that were signed by Sarah. For years, people would tell you, oh, yeah, the best bottles you can get are all signed by Sarah. <laughs> and so that was just driving so much excitement. That excitement, especially early on in the business, was as the business was building, was gaining a bigger and bigger following. And uh, that was really that was really fueling the growth and the excitement of our of our business. That's really where we made our name. Yeah, it's a great segue to thinking about you know there's this two paths in the market it seems for whiskey and bourbon. There's the super premium that people talk about and hear about the brands that you know you read about, and then there's the the whiskeys and bourbons that are accessible that you know you can find in your store that. Obviously, everything's on a spectrum, but give us your take on that balance between the prestige product at the ultra luxury price and the amazing products that are accessible to most consumers. That's been a difficult thing for us. We feel like we had 
for a long time, we've done a better job of that now that we had really two different consumers. We had the consumer who was who was buying those very small releases, the single barrel picks, the private barrel selections, the Uber age product. And then we had people who were buying contradiction bourbon and contradiction rye priced very different, very different products. And so what we've, what we've tried to do is to try to blend those two different things together. The single biggest issue with the first customer, the one, the Uber enthusiast is that a large percentage of them, we're, again, we're grateful for them. I have a lot of friends that are in this, in this uh, category, but they're not very brand loyal because what they're chasing is what's next, what's unique. And while we have some fans who are own hundreds, hundreds of bottles of Smooth Ambler, Old Scout custom barrel selections, those people are also looking for the next high proof, the next old, the next finish, the next single barrel pick. And and that becomes that collector, that obsessive bourbon hunter. And so it is a challenge trying to find, to to make room for that consumer while also making room for the consumer for or time for the for the contradiction consumer. Because ultimately it builds excitement for your brand. Yeah. It builds a halo for your brand, but I'm not sure it moves the needle the same way. We don't, you know, selling another it's, we're grateful again. Selling another 200 barrels is really great and it's exciting and it's the stuff that we love to do. But really what we need is somebody who comes in and buys a bottle of bottle of whiskey once a month, right? And that's the yeah. same brand they're going to buy from now and they're going to buy that brand 10 years from now. And that's, the, that's the consumer that you want, somebody who's brand loyal and buys the same pro- product and shares that with friends and has it on the shelf all the time. And so it, sure. it is a hard thing to navigate I think what we've done is done a really, really good job is to elevate our products are getting better and better. So contradiction is getting older. We're better at making whiskey than we were when we first started. Heck, if you're not better at what you're doing today than you were five or 10 years ago, stop and go do something else. <laughs> Amen. Right. So we make better whiskey. The whiskey is older. We're better at blending the whiskey. And so the whiskey that we put into the bottle today is so much better than the whiskey that we put into the bottle two years ago or four years ago or six or eight years ago. And and so I think the, all of those products are increasing in quality. And so the the gap between those super premium products and the everyday product that we have on the shelf, it's not the way it used to be. It is a pretty small gap sure. now. You know, and, and we try to tell people that as loudly as we can all the time. Yeah. So you build this amazing brand, you grow this amazing company, and now you're you're on the heels of a, of a transition, as um, you know you join Pernod. So I'm curious to hear the story of that process. Give us kind of the the quick version of that. Yeah. So um, in 2016, we were running out of distillate. We were running out of sourced whiskey rather. And we were looking for sourced whiskey to help fill the Old Scout pipeline. It turns out that Pernod used to be, now they're back in the whiskey business, but they used to be heavily in the whiskey business many, many years ago. And we thought that they might have some distillate. And so a friend called them up. I don't think they had distillate at the time. They had maybe just sold it or weren't really interested in getting, getting rid of it. But they said that they were interested in the brand, and they came and toured the facility, and and they came to the dis, they came to the distillery, and um, and really it was an interesting time. There were there were a bunch of people who were going through these M and A deals and making strategic partnerships with large distribution companies, large brands like Pernod Ricard, and so I was concerned that we were going to be on the outside of that partnership looking in, that all of the people that we considered competitors were going to now be matched up with these heritage distribution, heritage companies, the big distributors of the world. And we were going to be outside, you know, trying to fight for what was left of the scraps. And so while at the same time we were having these inventory concerns, we were in a, in a period where we were under this lot of this, this lots of growth, and that I was concerned about how all of those things might affect us and how they might affect us financially. On a personal note, I was also doing everything. When they first started interested in us, getting interested in us, they asked us to do a uh, do some due diligence. And I think sure. out of the 
390 items that they had us do, I was responsible for about 370 of them. <laughs> I just felt like that was unsustainable. So we needed people who were uh, experts in their field, whether that was you know, accounting, people that could bring some, obviously some capital to the table, some expertise in the production facility. I was reaching the point of which, you know, somebody, I was not trained as a distiller, somebody that could bring in some expertise in that field. And so I just felt like they were a really good fit. A good friend yeah. who had worked for them in the past said they were as much like a family business as any large business could be. And that's ultimately what made us make the decision to join Pernod Ricard. Awesome. Clearly, transparency is one of your guiding principles when it comes to business. You've got another one that I've read that I want to hear you talk about, which is do what's right. Where'd that come from and how has it become one of your business operating principles? You know, it's interesting. I, I think about this quite a bit. We, we wanted to look at everything. What are our hiring practices? How do we treat our employees? Most importantly, what do we do when things don't go right? Right? Everybody can be there when you're getting yeah. praise for the world's best single barrel. Great. Are you there when one of your product releases don't go well? Or do you answer consumer complaints? Are you as available on social media then as you are when you're celebrating your success? Yeah. I see some people in the business that I don't think are doing what I would do. But I don't think that they're being nice people in the business, right? Whether that's about corporate, some 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 sort of company yeah. greed, whether that's about being divisive on social media solely for the purpose of gaining attention, or whether that's just not really caring about what happens to people who are unlike you are. And don't get me wrong, we've made some of those mistakes as well. But I, I think that ultimately it came down to us that we were trying to do the right thing every time trying to treat our employees really, really well, to stand up for certain social issues that um, maybe we weren't. We think we're, we're a very, as much as we can be in Southern West Virginia, that is predominantly, you know, largely, I think it's, I think West Virginia is 96% white, you know, trying to, trying to make sure that our hiring practices are fair and give people um, wonderful opportunities here that, again, like that might not otherwise get them. And so for us, it was, it's, it's a really big thing to try to narrow down. It was just trying to be good yeah. people. And one of the things that I come up to all the time is that recently, a lot of people have said, that's really great. It's, oh man, I love the honesty and transparency and you're doing the right thing. And, and I think to myself, why is doing the right thing some sort of anomaly and, and I even catch myself sometimes thinking, yeah. oh, we don't get enough credit for all the good we've done. And how selfish of me to think that we should be getting credit for doing the right thing. I'm doing exactly the thing that I say that people shouldn't be doing, which is out here just looking for credit because they're being good people. Like, that's what you're supposed to do, <laughs> you know? So yeah. I catch myself sometimes doing that too. Well, I mean, I think it's worth reframing this in a slightly different perspective, which is you're in practice, but also, you know, I've heard you talk about it a little bit, an individual who focuses on the positive. And, um, and that seems to also be another key way that you run your business and your life. So where did this active decision to be more positive come from? And how, did, how has it impacted work and life? And sell it to everybody else. I think it's, I think it's worth selling to everybody. <laughs> In the last, whatever, six or 10 years, it seemed like everything is divisive. And the people that get the most attention are the people who are on either ends of the spectrum and really who yell the loudest. And I didn't want to be yeah. a part of that. I wanted to, I wanted to be the change that I wanted to see in the world. I know that sounds really crazy, but it meant something to me. And I also wanted to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes to understand the difficulties that somebody else might have in their own lives. And I really wanted to try to change that. Mostly, I really wanted to stop complaining. People that don't do complain. I'm not a complainer. I want to be somebody who goes out there and does something and makes a change in the world. So whether that's about creating our business and trying to do business the right way, it's about running for city council, just being a good neighbor. Stop complaining. Go make a change. Go offer a solution to someone. If you've got a problem, see if you can find a solution for it. Talk to your friends and your neighbors. Have a glass of bourbon. Talk to the people that you don't think you can get a along with and see if y'all can come up with a, yeah. a solution to make it better. I don't always live by that principle. It is a struggle. I, I'm really good at being an ass. 
So I'm out here fighting this struggle every day, trying to be, trying to be yeah. a good person. But you're going to get up every day and you're going to make a decision on how you want to live your life. Do you want to sit there and complain about everything or do you want to go out there and try to make a difference? And I think that's what I'm trying to do. It'll be a struggle, I'm sure, for, right, for the rest of my life. You, you said something that, um, I love, you know, go grab a glass of bourbon, grab, grab a glass of wine and talk it out. Uh, obviously, at Consensus, we built a company on this idea of, you know, finding spaces to have conversations and inviting everybody into the room to have the conversation. And, and, and I also think one of the reasons we tell lots of stories about craft breweries around the country and uh, the story of Smooth Ambler and the story of the restaurants that are, you know, in cool communities doing cool things is because food and drink have this incredible power to bring us together. You know, whether it's at a party around where everyone's standing around the the bar, or in life, in a, in a more symbolic sense, and I'm wondering how you think about that the, the symbolism of your profession relative to you know how you think about trying to be more positive and being uh, open and, and encouraging of folks having conversations. One of the early adopters to to the bourbon world, a guy named Reed Bechtel, runs a a very large whiskey group in the U.S. And he sat on our porch at the distillery one time, smoking a cigar. There's maybe 10 of us out there having having a drink. And he said, bourbon is just the vessel that brings us together. And it has stuck with me so many times since then. And he's right. This, this is a hospitality business. Really what we're doing here is creating moments in people's lives where they celebrate something. It might be the end of the day. It might be a wedding. It might be the you know, something huge. It might be a anniversary. It's the birth of their child. Sometimes it's just times with friends. And the fact that somebody's going to sit around with a couple of their friends, a couple of their family, and have a glass of bourbon and relax, you know, those moments are special. Those life's everyday celebrations are maybe just as important than some of the really big celebrations in life. And so if you can use those times to to meet your neighbors to be closer to your friends, to understand that their perspective. I think that's one of the things that we get lost on sometimes is we get so focused on what's important to us that we lose someone else else's perspective on a, a particular subject. And so when you can learn about someone else's perspective and you can get not more knowledge than you had before you came into this conversation, isn't that great? And and the reality, that, again, in the world, yeah. we, we have these opposite ends of the spectrum, but most of us live pretty much in the middle. And I think it's really good for us to hear these perspectives of people who might have opinions different from our own, come together, understand what they think of. And I think that it really expands our life experiences. And uh, it's really great that you can make a product that helps that moment. You know, you've got this bottle of contradiction bourbon in front of you, invite some friends over to to come over and share some whiskey like that, to make a cocktail together, to have some dinner together, or being with people, having these, these really wonderful moments of consumption, or as Pernod calls them, these moments of conviviality. I think that's that's really wonderful. Yeah. I know in your personal life, you're, you talked about at the little beginning, you know, you're a big fisherman, a big outdoorsman. I'm curious how you see kind of conservation um, and the natural environment as part of your life and your legacy. One of the great things I love about our business is the majority of our waste, spent grain, it goes to cattle feed, right? So the, our yep. byproduct is it turns it turns it into tasty cows. So that's always a really cool thing. We're trying to, you know, we recycle all of our cardboard. Our, our biggest issue really is, um, you know, distilleries are, are heavy energy user, users. Pernod is really working to change that and reduce their carbon footprint and change some of that over the next yeah. uh, 10 to 30 years. And one of the big problems we have, I think, is packaging, glass packaging is heavy. So that's probably the biggest change that we make. And then receiving things that come into us. Sure. Packaging waste is a big problem. And so we're all working to improve that and to make the differences that we think we can make. So we're, we're doing our absolute best inside of our production facility. So you know, do what you can do in business, in your, in your business, and do what you can do in your personal life. I think if everybody did that and really cares about all those things, I think it makes a huge difference. Anything else that you want to plug? Let's, let's make sure folks know where to find their local bottle of contradiction or Old Scout or whatever they're looking for. Yeah, you you know, first of all, I think again, as I mentioned earlier, we're we're better at doing this than we than we've ever been, 
And I think people think of Smooth Ambler as the the golden years when we were doing these single barrels, these limited releases in 2012 to 2016. I've never been more excited about the whiskey that we make than I am today. Awesome. We're just better. The whiskey's just better. Yeah. And uh, if you haven't tried Smooth Ambler, you want to try us again, you know, you can find us on uh, Instagram and Twitter at Smooth Ambler. You can find us on Facebook with the same thing, smoothambler.com. And if you want to know where to buy Smooth Ambler in your neighborhood, you can go to our website and there's a buy button and it'll geolocate you. It'll tell you every store and what product they have right near you. So, uh, and if you're ever in West Virginia, come by the distillery and uh, we'll roll out the red carpet for you. All right. We'll put it in the notes, but highly encourage everyone. Like I said, we love, we love what's happening in West Virginia and can't praise that enough either. So, Thank you so much for taking the time today to tell us your story, to inspire us. Um, it was a lot of fun, so I, I can't can't say thanks enough. I'm honored to be here personally, and thanks for sharing the uh, gospel with Smooth Ambler. Thank you to John for the great conversation. Consensus in Conversation is hosted by me, Connor Gaughan. The episode is produced by Will Gatchell and Chandler Bramstead. Executive produced by me with editing from Reasonable Volume. Special thanks to Consensus Creative Director Kate Tucker and our strategist Patrick Gallagher. Don't forget to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And we'll see you next week.